Are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Red and Blue. Amid crippling unemployment, record coronavirus cases, and plummeting poll numbers, President Trump took to the South Lawn of the White House to talk about deregulation. The president used the event to criticize the Obama administration and celebrate his White House's attempt to roll back rules he says are limiting choice. We're bringing back consumer choice and home appliances so that you can buy washers and dryers, shower heads and faucets, dishwashers. You didn't have any water, so you, the people that do the dishes, you press it and it goes again, and you do it again and again. So you might as well give them the water because you'll end up using less water. So we made it so dishwashers now have a lot more water, and in many places, in most places of the country, water is not a problem. They don't know what to do with it. It's called rain. They don't have a problem. And old-fashioned incandescent light bulbs, I brought them back. I brought them back. After a problematic rally in Tulsa and falling poll numbers, President Trump is making a change at the top of his campaign. Brad Parscale is being demoted from Trump campaign manager to senior advisor for data and digital operations. Sources close to the campaign tell CBS News Parscale took heat for failing to build out strong campaign operations in key battleground states. Former White House political director Bill Stepien will take his place. A pair of new state estimates from our CBS News Battleground tracker find the president trailing presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden by three points in North Carolina and by two points in the state of Georgia. President Trump won both states in 2016. So this means in the five state estimates released by CBS News so far, President Trump leads only in one, Texas. In other new national polls, the president is also slipping. An NBC News Wall Street Journal poll released yesterday shows Joe Biden with an 11-point lead, and that is up from seven points last month. Additionally, 50 percent of respondents say there is no chance they are voting for Mr. Trump in November. The president seems to believe the problem is the polls. We think we're doing very well. We had some poll numbers a little while ago that are great. You know, it's the same story. It's uh, suppression polls that we had in 2016, phony polls. Uh, fake news, phony polls, same thing. And we're doing very well. We're doing well in Georgia. We're doing well in Texas. I have read uh, where I was one point up in Texas. I'm not one point up in Texas. We're many points up. But according to The New York Times today, even if polls are as off as they were in 2016, Biden still currently leads in five out of the six traditional battleground states. Zeke Miller joins me now. He's a CBSN political contributor and White House reporter for the Associated Press. Welcome, Zeke. Great to see you. So, Zeke, why is the president talking about dishwashers and incandescent light bulbs while coronavirus cases are at an all-time high and rising? You know, it's it's twofold, and it's good to be with you. Uh, first, you know, we're seeing the president try to uh, inject what has essentially been a campaign around a cultural war that he's been trying to uh, to wage uh, from the White House over the last several months, whether it be on racial issues, social issues, uh, and now consumer issues, uh, for lack of a better a better term, there environmental policy as well sort of falls into that category. Uh, and that's one part of it. The president believes that it animates his his base of supporters. The other element is that those are familiar lines from the president's uh, stump speeches from his campaign rallies, which you know sort of served as the uh, the central force of his 2016 campaign and were going to be his you know not so secret weapon in 2020, and he was going to hope that energy would bring him send him back to the White House, and those seem to be uh, uh, certainly on hold now uh, in the, in this age of the coronavirus. The return to the rallies, as you mentioned in Tulsa, did not go well at all. Um, and his uh, attempt to hold a rally in New Hampshire this past weekend didn't work very well either. So uh, he's experimenting now with trying to do these sort of 
quasi rallies on the White House grounds. We saw him do a version of that Monday night, and we saw him uh, just do one today, uh, where he's trying to sort of inject his traditional campaign lines with attacks on on uh, on presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden, and uh, try to wage uh, a, a, a quote unquote Rose Garden strategy. But instead of uh, it just being a uh, uh, you know a speech using the powers of the, the trappings of the presidency to send him back to the White House, he's giving sort of very overt political statements uh, and, and campaign mm -hmm. speeches. Uh, from the White House in an attempt to reach his supporters. So, Zeke, in addition to these recent polls that are showing Biden gaining ground, there are a handful of rising unfavorables for President Trump. And all this happens while Biden's campaign schedule has been relatively light on public events. So what are the potential factors behind Mr. Trump's slide? You know, it's everything from the, uh, the his handling of the coronavirus, which is sort of this dominant issue. Um, uh, in, 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 in American life right now, political life as well. Uh, that, that's sort of probably the, the number one issue. Uh, but attend, uh, sort of going along with that is the economic issue. That was sort of the central promise of the president back in 2016, that he was going to improve the economic lives of Americans. And while that may have been true for the first three years of his presidency, uh, for a lot of Americans, they're not better off than they were four years ago right now because of the coronavirus. And so that is an issue as well for the president. We're starting to see his, his numbers on the economy, which had been his uh, his strongest approval point uh, uh, in surveys over the last several years also take a hit in the age of the coronavirus. And then there are, and then there are also his, his handling of issues like social unrest and, and racial justice issues that have uh, further uh, hurt him, in, in, particularly in, in suburban areas. So all of those together, you know, uh, ha, ha, have taken a toll on the president. We're seeing him try to—he uh, he believes he's faded out of the public conversation to a certain extent. We're seeing him try to re-inject himself like we are with, with these campaign rallies at the White House, uh, mm -hmm. trying to get back in the daily conversation, just as Joe Biden is now is trying to find new ways to reach voters as well. And, of course, when he's asked about the polls, he takes a familiar stance and says, it's the polls that are faulty. Um, so if the president genuinely thinks he's winning, which I sometimes think it's hard to tell what's sort of bravado and, and what he genuinely believes, but if he genuinely thinks that he's winning, what is the reasoning, then, behind the campaign manager changeup? Uh, part of it is uh, frustrations with, with, with Parscale because of— uh, uh, of his handling of the Tulsa rally, that, that you know, he was promising as many as a million people showing up, and you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that that actually materialized on the ground, and and that was a sort of a humiliating uh, picture for the president. So there's there's that one particular instance, and he was uh, in, in the words of some campaign folks, sort of a dead man walking ever since then over the last month. Um, mm. But you know, it, more broadly, if you look at what what new campaign manager Bill Stepien put out in a statement to reporters today. Uh, saying uh, essentially, you know, it sounded like a campaign. The campaign recognized that they are the underdogs in this race. He talked about, you know, winning every day or trying to win every day between now and election day. Uh, the sort of rhetoric that you would you, you would you would take out from a campaign that is trying to claw its way back to the top of the polls and now and recognizes that the president is behind. That is not something we're likely to hear from the president, who rarely acknowledges um, you know, sort of how he feels about the race and how he assesses the race. But certainly, the president's political advisors are being a little bit more candid and uh, signaling that they uh, are recognizing that they're behind in, in public and private surveys right now. Mm -hmm. and so, Zeke, the Biden campaign filed its latest fundraising numbers with the FEC today. The presumptive Democratic nominee now has $242 million in the bank. That's up from $57 million in April. So where is this money coming from exactly, and how does it compare to the Trump campaign's war chest? Well, the Trump campaign war chest, uh, uh, I'll start with the second part there, um, had been uh, their secret weapon um, all, all through this, uh, uh, this cycle. They claimed they had an insurmountable financial advantage over, over, over Democrats. They, they claimed there was no way to, that Joe Biden and Democrats were going to be able to meet, uh, to meet their war chest. And yes, they are still ahead uh, on the cash on, on hand uh, game. But uh, Joe Biden has done a, a, a very good job, it seems, uh, of, of tapping into new grassroots donors as well as high dollar uh, Democratic donors. We've seen him do fundraisers with uh, uh, entertainment celebrities, uh, pol uh, political figures, uh, former rivals, uh, Wall Street executives. All, all of them, and uh, they have opened their checkbooks for him, as well as sort of traditional, uh, sort of traditional online small dollar fundraising. All of that has come to help close that gap for him. And at a certain point, you know, th they're now roughly on par with each other in terms of net effect. Uh, 
when you you know it, it, yes the Trump campaign might be ahead, but in terms of what uh, what that dollar what those dollars can actually do for a campaign between now and election day, you get uh, the difference the marginal difference in 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 ads what you can buy with that isn't really all of that different. So. Uh, Biden was able to very mm -hmm. quickly, it seems now, get himself into the, at the level where he needed to be to contest this race. Okay, so meanwhile, Zeke, let's do a quick coronavirus uh, chat because Dr. Anthony Fauci did confirm to CBS News he spoke to President Trump today for the first time in six weeks. He didn't disclose what they discussed, but publicly their relationship has seemed a little strained. But I, what I do want to ask you about is the, what's the latest on the RNC's planned in-person Jacksonville convention next month? I mean, is the RNC planning to, to change things now in light of how bad things are in Florida? Yeah, right now everything is in flux, uh, and it's it's it, it, the uh, the RNC uh, chairwoman uh, Ron McDaniel put out a letter to RNC members today saying only actual delegates to the convention, that's about 2,500 people or so, uh, uh, would be allowed to attend the first three nights of the convention down in Jacksonville, which will likely be held outdoors, and that uh, the larger universe of the guests and alternate delegates, roughly 10,000 in all, would attend the final night where the president was going to deliver his. Uh, uh, his acceptance speech uh, in Jacksonville on that fourth night. Um, even that uh, is still tentative uh, and because, you know, mm -hmm. the weather in Jacksonville in late August is unpredictable. It's hurricane season. It's hot, humid, muggy. And, and uh, so th there's that factor uh, on one side. There's the factor of whether or not people are going to want to, want to travel down to, uh, down to Florida in those conditions. If it's only for one night, it's a significant expense for some people. And the other factor is because cases in Florida uh, ha have been skyrocketing over the last several weeks. Florida is now on the list of states where, for a lot of uh, states where they've done a better job of controlling the virus, that if you return to that state, those states from Florida, for instance, New York, uh, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, some of the West Coast states, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So not only would uh, would, would, would attendees to this convention uh, be uh, you, know, su you know subjecting themselves to to personal risk of going there, when they get home, they would have to. Ho uh, hole up in their homes for 14 days afterwards. That is a very significant, uh, not just financial expense, but a sort of lifestyle expense, so to speak, uh, for these people. So that may uh, reduce attendance. So uh, that's why nothing is set in stone here. It's, there is still a chance that this can even be further, that you know, the, the, the grand convention the president wanted uh, can be further shrunk uh, between now and then. A lot in flux. All right. Well, Zeke Miller, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.